In the courtyard of Madrid's royal palace, the king's guard recalls an era of regal splendor, privilege, and might in Spain's past. But the saga of Juan Carlos is distinctly modern. When he became king in 1975, he took the reins of government from Europe's last fascist dictator. He was to inherit a land touched by forces unlike the rest of Europe. A land chosen by destiny to become the greatest power on earth, then doomed to lapse into decades of decline and stagnation. In the extraordinary reign of Juan Carlos, Spain has leapt into the 20th century. But as new ideas, concepts, and values flood in, the Spanish people cherish the ways that are uniquely theirs. Mindful of the grandeur of their past, even as they create a new and unknown future, they nurture and treasure the timeless traditions that illuminate the soul of Spain. Spain, dramatic, mysterious, complex. Greatness and tragedy resonate in its soul. It gave the world the essence of chivalry in Don Quixote, the quintessence of cruelty in the Inquisition. Long after the rest of Europe industrialized, Spain remained poor and agrarian. Hereditary noblemen and wealthy families still owned much of the land, and controlled it by the laws and privileges of their class. Inward looking, the people proudly clung to their ancient heritage, customs and beliefs. Who are they? Where did they come from? What shaped the Spanish soul? Lying astride the Atlantic and Mediterranean on the Iberian Peninsula, Spain has been called that country ripped from hot Africa, soldered crudely to inventive Europe. First settled by wandering tribes from Europe and North Africa, it would be colonized by Phoenicians, Carthaginians, and Greeks. By 19 BC, the triumphant Romans dominated the peninsula. They would leave their indelible imprint of architecture, law, and language. Later, Roman missionaries would introduce Christianity. Led by Arab warriors, in 711, Berbers from North Africa swept into Spain. Soon their rule and Muslim religion gripped the land. Working side by side, Muslim, Christian, and Jewish scholars relit the torch of learning that led Europe out of the Dark Ages. Cordoba, capital of Muslim Spain, became Europe's most cultured city, boasting half a million inhabitants when London and Paris were only villages. But through the eight centuries of Muslim rule, the Christians waged war to reconquer the land until only Granada survived as a Muslim stronghold. In 1492, the last Muslim king surrendered his crown to the Catholic sovereigns, Ferdinand and Isabella. 
Through war and inquisition, Spain would expel not only the Muslims, but all Jews who refused to be baptized. Seeking a western route to the riches of India, Ferdinand and Isabella would provide Christopher Columbus with financial support. On the 33rd day of his voyage, Columbus landed in the New World and claimed it in the name of the Spanish crown. Spain would conquer huge empires in the Americas. Gold wrested from native peoples would finance wars in faraway Europe. And Spain would become the world's mightiest power. But two centuries later, its navy defeated, its empire in shambles, Spain's era of supremacy was over. A long eclipse had begun. Nineteen thirty six. With the Second Republic torn by political turmoil, Spain is plunged into bloody civil war. An alliance of army officers, monarchists, and the Catholic Church joins the fascists in rebellion. They are supported by Hitler and Mussolini in a conflict that becomes a dress rehearsal for the Second World War. The death toll from combat and executions will cost the nation half a million lives. 1939. With the fall of Madrid, General Francisco Franco, commander of the victorious nationalist troops, assumes powers greater than those of any monarch in Spain's history. Nationalist, rightist, and authoritarian, the dictator Franco embarks on 36 years of repressive control. When World War II rages across Europe, the wily Franco manages to keep Spain out of the conflict. The role of women remains static circumscribed by church tradition and male domination. Physically shattered and spiritually crippled in the long aftermath of war, the nation will need years to heal. Franco orders construction of the Valley of the Fallen to commemorate the Civil War dead. Although named El Caudillo, the leader for life, he knows that someday he too will find his final resting place here. Believing a monarchy would best serve Spain, Franco selects as his successor the grandson of the last king. Born in exile, Juan Carlos first set foot on Spanish soil at age 10. His father, legitimate heir to the throne, had acquiesced to Franco's desire to educate the boy. The prince would spend four years in the Army, Navy, and Air Force academies, attend university, and complete his studies at a number of government ministries. In 1975, the nation observes the end of an era. For nearly four decades, Franco had made all of Spain's important decisions. Juan Carlos, rarely seen except in Franco's shadow, was perceived to be molded in his image. Would the nation again erupt in rebellion? Juan Carlos swore his allegiance to the Constitution and the people. Desde la emoción 
en el recuerdo a Franco, ¡viva el rey! ¡Viva! ¡Viva España! ¡Viva! Perceptive and intelligent, he had privately concluded Spain must embark on a new course. Secretly, he had prepared himself for it. To everyone's surprise, he deftly led his people from dictatorship to democracy. A king who pays taxes, lives modestly, and is an avid sports enthusiast, he soon became the most popular man in the country. His greatest test came in 1981, when Parliament was invaded by civil guards commanded by a right-wing colonel. As an amazed public watched on television, the colonel called for a return to a Francoist regime. Working through the night as Parliament was held hostage, the king obtained pledges of loyalty from his principal military leaders and quelled the attempted coup. His reassuring address to the people included these words. The crown cannot tolerate actions attempting to interrupt by force the democratic process. Under his leadership, a vital and dynamic new Spain has become an economic success story. The nation is an eager new member of the European community. Its 39 million citizens have a higher standard of living than ever in their history. And there is freedom of religion, of expression. <laughs> the repression of old has evaporated. A burst of growth has transformed the nation. Every year, Spain attracts 50 million tourists, more than the country's total population. They bring billions of dollars, new ideas and customs. The Spaniards, once Europe's poor relations, have become conspicuous consumers. But behind the facade of modern Spain, echoes of an older way of life still resonate. In the same year that Franco died, so did Don Fernando de la Camara, one of the wealthy landowners who had supported the dictator. Camara's presence can still be felt in the Seville apartment where his heir, Rocio, lives. She is now the head of her family's agricultural business. As her father did, Rocio grows wheat and sunflowers and raises bulls to fight in the ring. Every year, the new calves are rounded up for brandy. Oh. 
In this tough and traditionally male-oriented atmosphere, Rocio has found acceptance. Evidentemente es más difícil que siendo hombre. Pero bueno, la sociedad va evolucionando. Of course, it's harder being a woman, but society is changing, and nowadays there are no real problems, big problems. If I were a man, I'd wrestle those calves, but as a woman, I can't. But there are many important things to do on a ranch where being a woman makes no difference at all. Diego Reyna has been employed by the Camaras for more than 20 years. He helped raise Rocio, and when her father died, continued as foreman. He has had other job offers, but he respects and admires Rocio. He says he will never leave. Unlike his peers of 25 years ago, Diego receives an adequate income, has his own house, and can look forward to retirement with Social Security. Today, Diego has the right to vote, but, like many others, still prefers the old ways. Personally, I felt more at ease under Franco than now. Nobody bothered anybody. You could bet down in the fields anywhere. Now you can't. In the last few years before Franco died, life was peaceful in the country. We ate well in the country. And we could save a peseta or two. Who saves anything nowadays? Whether Juan, Pedro or Antonio is in charge, the land is the same. We live off the land and die for the land. It's always the same. Always the same. Diego's land is Andalusia. In this southernmost region of Spain, under a brilliant sun and sky, olive trees and vineyards have thrived for thousands of years. Only here, in all the world, in a small area of chalky, moisture-retaining soil, is true sherry wine produced. In 1730, a French farmer founded a sherry dynasty in the town of Jerez de la Frontera. Today, the heirs of Pedro de Mec are the second largest producers of sherry in the world, part of an elite referred to as sherry barons. Still, even at age 77, Jose Ignacio de Mec enjoys driving to work on a second-hand motorbike purchased from his chauffeur. At the manor house that overlooks some of the Demek vineyards, he meets his eldest son. The manor was built around an ancient tower used during the Middle Ages to send smoke signals to Africa, only 65 miles away. It provides a vantage point from which the Demex can confer about the 4,300 acres of vineyards they cultivate here. One day, the younger Jose Ignacio will take control of their wine and brandy empire in Spain and the Americas. Demex produces 10 million liters of sherry annually.
The most vital element in creating a distinctive sherry is the human factor, specifically the human nose. In the bodegas, where sherry matures, the Demex exercise the delicate skill which has made the family masters of the art of winemaking for 250 years. We maintain our standardization of quality throughout the different generations. My father is known in the wine world for the nose, not only because of the size of it, that is, uh, you have seen is rather big, but because he's considered one of the most important specialists in Europe in the science of wine. Okay. The unique quality of sherry derives from the Solera system. New sherry is blended with more mature sherry to take on its characteristics. Fortified with grape brandy and repeatedly blended, it ages in oak casks until it reaches maturity. The most venerable bodega holds casks of rare sherry dedicated to the famous. Among them is one once reserved for George IV, King of England. A cask was dedicated to Napoleon in 1812. And after the Battle of Trafalgar, Admiral Lord Nelson's body was shipped to England perfectly preserved in a cask of brandy and sherry. At his nearby estate, one of the 500 relatives who are shareholders in the Demek Corporation indulges in another family passion. For 20 years, Alvaro Demek, like his father before him, was famed for his prowess in the Spanish art of bullfighting on horseback. Today, he raises fine Andalusian horses and bulls to fight in the ring. was once the leisure pastime of gentlemen on horseback. Farmhands assisted with their capes. Modern bullfighting performed by professionals on foot began only two centuries ago. Bullfights are the highlight of the annual April Fair in nearby Herith. For this special event, six local breeders each enter a superior bull in the competition for best of the year. Domek is here, sharing the crowd's anticipation and hoping his bull will bring honor to the family's reputation as breeders.
Victor Mendes, the matador who will face that bull, prepares for his test as he dons the traditional suit of lights. The bullring manager and other well-wishers come bearing the only protection they can offer. Suerte. Good luck. As his sword handler makes final adjustments, Mendes reflects on the trial ahead. It's uh, now a fight, a game uh, between the rational and the irrational, if possible, uh, to arrive to the, to, the, to the death, the death of the bull. But sometimes it's the death of a man. To the Spaniard, the bullfight is not a game, but a revered ritual. Not a sport, but an art. Its origins can be traced to pagan sacrifices and to ancient Greek and Roman games. In its beauty, glorification of bravery, and disdain for death, the bullfight embodies traditional values of Spanish life. More than spectacle, this is mythic theater, in which the drama of life and death is reenacted, culminating in the predictable, but by no means certain, death of a noble beast. In recent years, it has lost popularity, and there is increasing disquiet among a minority of Spaniards about the morality of their national fiesta. But for some, it remains an irreplaceable thread in the fabric of their heritage. As the afternoon turns to evening, crowds begin to gather at the fairgrounds. In this week-long celebration, women wear traditional Andalusian dresses. Friends meet, sip sherry, make music, and dance. The region of Estremadura in western Spain has always been harsh and ungiving. For decades, Aswaga, like many small agricultural and mining towns, has slowly but steadily lost its population. The future looks bleak unless young people can be persuaded to stay. Among the few professionals here is a husband and wife team of doctors assigned to the local clinic. Their 16-year-old daughter, Alicia, feels trapped in the stifling atmosphere. This is a small town. There isn't much for me to do. I'm not sure whether to stay or leave. I'll probably leave, but I still haven't decided. The lack of entertainment, career opportunities, even participation in sports, all make teenagers yearn for greater freedom. 
The old ways hold no allure for the young generation. When Alicia's parents accept job offers in Seville, she is thrilled to go with them. She will become one of the thousands who seek new lives in big cities. Spain's new constitution carefully spells out the equality of opportunity for men and women. After high school, Alicia hopes to join the growing ranks of working women. Then, after a couple of years, when I've mastered that job, I'll study business management, and after that, join a big company. I'd work my way to the top and eventually have my own company. As a businesswoman, I travel. I'd like to travel a lot in my work. Today, many women are entering the ranks of leadership in government, politics, and commerce. The unemployment rate of women is twice that of men. But like Alicia, they pursue an alluring dream. Spain's greatest contemporary poet, Garcia Lorca, described flamenco as deeper than the heart of the one creating it and the voice singing it. It comes from the first sob and the first kiss. Flamenco was born in Andalusia when Arabic and Spanish music mingled with the songs of the Jews. The gypsies were to adopt it and in their wanderings carry it throughout Spain. Francisca Sadornil, La Tati as she is known, was born here in Madrid. She learned flamenco dancing from gypsies, married a gypsy in her youth, and remains among the rare outsiders accepted by them artistically and socially. A professional dancer from the age of 12, La Tati has dedicated her life to flamenco. And flamenco has taken Latati from a working class neighborhood to the concert stages of the world. She reminisces. I can't remember a time when I didn't dance. I was born on Toledo Street, and there all the neighbors were Andalusians and gypsies. At number five of the Plaza de Cascorro was Kika, the dancing professor of Seville. I went to Kika when I was about seven. I never paid for a dancing class because there was not money in my family. I slept at the academy on a mattress between chairs. I helped Kika clean the academy and did the errands, and this way I learned to dance. Today she passes her knowledge to a new generation. She reflects on teaching. With recording, singers and movie actors can leave their way of singing or playing music, but with dancing it's a little more difficult. If you don't do it through teaching, you can't leave a school of dance. This is why I like teaching very much.
Latati is highly sought as a teacher, but as an artist, she gets her deepest satisfaction from performance. My life is shaped on the stage. All that I feel or live for, everything, all my suffering and all my glory, all my life is on the stage. She rehearses for a tour that will take her to France. The quality of flamenco is to get out of a difficult situation of crying and of sorrow, to get into an explosion of happiness and a feeling born in the soul and the heart. Flamenco is an expression of the soul. The guitar is the instrument of Spain. In the working class neighborhood where he grew up, Arcángel Fernández has handcrafted guitars for 36 years. I had my first job at 11 as a furniture maker. Later, I became fond of playing the guitar. I started to play flamenco. Then I met a great maestro of guitar making, one of the best in the world. Since I had found that the artistic environment was not much to my liking, I found myself turning to guitar making. Only fine imported woods are used to create the body of the guitar. They are carefully heated and shaped as the craftsman gradually brings the instrument to life. To make a good handcrafted guitar, you need at least one month. The difference between handcrafted and factory guitars are many, starting with materials. The materials we use are quite expensive. You must have knowledge of the trade and put love into your work. For me, that is the secret for making a good guitar. Nothing else. Signed and numbered by the craftsman, a finished instrument may cost from two to ten thousand dollars. Through this artist's expression, the guitar gives voice to the Spanish soul.
During the decades of Franco's dictatorship, the Catholic Church was able to legally enforce its rigid doctrines. Even between engaged couples, premarital contact was forbidden by the strictures of traditional courtship. Among the middle and upper classes, a single woman could not go out without a female chaperone to watch over her. Today, young women go out alone and party at bars until 4 a.m. Agata Ruiz de la Prada is among the contemporary Spanish women who now define their own roles in society. Agata lives in a quiet Madrid suburb with her son, Tristan, and the boy's father. Her seemingly bourgeois home life is not quite what it appears. My mother and father separate when I have more or less 12. And my mother goes to live to Barcelona. So for me it was very nice because I have two cities and two houses, and I have always the liberty of choosing one or the other. I have never believed in marriage. The liberty is very important for me, and marriage is something that I don't like. Ruiz de la Prada is a designer and businesswoman. These dolls, whose costumes she creates, sold over a million in Spain alone last year. She also designs highly original clothing. When I was little, I wanted to be a, a painter. One thing that I have ever hated is the distance, the big distance between a picture in a wall and the way that, that people live. I think that you, when you like some picture, you must wear it, no? And you must eat with it, and you must sleep with it. You must put it in your life, no? Humorous and deliberately outrageous, her designs have brought her international recognition. The impulse behind them, in fact, springs from a traditionally Spanish attitude, that of the rugged individualist. Barcelona, Spain's largest seaport, the nation's second city and industrial powerhouse. Barcelona is also the center of a rich and highly original artistic tradition. This legacy is evident everywhere. In a mosaic pavement created by the great Joan Miró, A design created by Picasso in his self-imposed exile during the Franco years. And the undulating curves of a facade by Antoni Gaudí. A genius who used the sinuous forms of nature as the vocabulary for his architecture, Gaudí was dubbed visionary and madman. Son of a coppersmith, he was modest and self-effacing. Refused by the one woman to whom he proposed, he would dedicate his life exclusively to architecture and God. He maintained, God continues creation.
natural man. In 1884, he began work on the Sagrada Familia, the expiatory temple of the Holy Family. It would be his masterpiece. But in 1926, returning from evening church services to sleep in his workshop, Gaudí was struck by a streetcar. Three days later, he died. Thousands followed the funeral cortege to his final resting place, the crypt of his unfinished basilica. Today, Gaudí's vision continues to take shape above him. From the beginning, construction has been funded by public donations. Only some 50 artists and craftsmen are employed. Architect Jordi Bonnet, like his father, a specialist in the works of Gaudí, has been entrusted with completion of the building. As much a sculptor as an architect, Gaudí preferred to make models rather than work from drawings. Using them, Bonnet is able to continue according to Gaudí's concept. A model of the nave, the central part of the church, reveals columns whose design was inspired by shapes found in nature. They will support the ceiling of the nave, filling the shell that has stood empty for over a century. With all these Gaudi original elements, it is possible to continue it and to build in his place the nave. But it is not so easy to continue it. But uh, I hope to have or to are in the same spirit of Gaudi, and for them we are working with, with all our forces to make the best. Gaudi say the nave of this temple, it is a forest with the columns as a trees and then the light comes through these forests of columns, little columns, big columns, as a forest. Gaudi's dream was that this church would be a beacon of the Christian faith. Every year, hundreds of thousands from throughout the world visit his unfinished poem in stone a structure one architectural historian has called the greatest ecclesiastical monument of the last 100 years. Holy Week. Across the nation, cities and villages ready for a ritual of faith that occurs in few places outside Spain and nowhere with more passion than in Seville. Manolo Acosta dresses in the garb of an ancient religious brotherhood. For me, Holy Friday is one of the fundamental things of my life. So important that I'm thinking about that day the whole year. With his brotherhood, he will accompany sacred figures from their neighborhood church to Seville's cathedral and back. Thousands gather in anticipation of the moment when a priceless hand-carved image of the Virgin emerges from the cathedral.
Platforms called Passos support lavish figures of the sorrowing Virgin Mother, Christ, and scenes of his passion. From Palm Sunday until Easter, processions symbolically retrace the Stations of the Cross. Proceeding blindly under the directions of a guide, 30 to 40 bearers support the Passos, which may weigh up to two tons. Marching with their brotherhoods, thousands of penitents atone for sins committed through the year. They wear masks and hoods designed centuries ago to conceal the sinners from all but God. As the people of Spain approach the 21st century, they seek to define their new identity, strengthened by the timeless elements of Spanish life, the ardor for spectacle and beauty, the rich history, proud land, and enduring traditions that are the soul of Spain.